Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be looking at valuations and whether there's, n there's a need to revalue how we value our portfolios. Um, I'm joined by a distinguished panel. Um, if I start, I will introduce myself. I'm Paul Cunningham. I am CFO of Helios Investment Partners an Africa-focused private equity manager, um, and also for my sins, I'm chairman of the IPO board. Um, so I can move on to the other panelists. We start with Erica. Hi, my name is Erica Herberg. I'm currently the CFO of Alp Invest Partners, the division within the Carlisle Group. I've been in this current position for about a year and a half, uh, but I've been with the Carlisle Group and other finance roles over the last 20 years. Uh, Alpha Invest is a fund of funds manager, so we hold about 110 direct uh, holdings through our co-investment program, and then we make commitments to funds and we have a secondaries program. So we, from a valuations perspective, have thousands of underlying portfolio companies that roll into the valuations we reflect to our investors. Thank you, uh, and Jazzy? Hi, um, I'm Jesse Halai, and I work with 3i Group. Um, 3i Group is a listed um, private, uh, private equity and infrastructure firm. Um, so I, I look after the financial reporting regulation valuations as well, um, in, and value the private equity portfolio and input into the infrastructure as well. Thank you. And finally, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. My name is Daniel. I work for 10 years at Allianz Capital Partners. There we have four um, asset classes, which is actually direct investments um, divided in infrastructure and renewable energy and indirect investments also for infrastructure funds and private equity funds. In terms of indirect um, investments, we do also um, co-investments and there I'm responsible for um, the asset management uh, for the indirect strategies and for the reporting for all asset classes. With regard to valuations, um, yeah, we collect, actually analyze and challenge the valuation provided by the fund managers. And um, yeah, in this role, I represent actually um, limited partners in the IPF board to ensure the fair value importance of our limited partnership interest to make sure that actually asset allocation, investment decisions, and our future carry uh, duty for our own. Um, financial uh, reporting is met. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think before we actually dive into the panel session, it's probably worth just spending a minute or so um, just explaining what type of is, how it's made up, and you know, especially given the importance of valuations and the focus on valuations that we've seen over the last sort of six months. Um, you know, as a board, our aim is not to tell people how to do it, it's to give guidelines and guidance as to what should be considered when preparing the uh, periodic valuations of the portfolio. And you know, we're made up of a, a fairly disparate group of individuals um, appointed by the various um, member organizations. So the Invest Europe, BBCA, MPA, et cetera, all have the opportunity to nominate members to the board. Um, we try to maintain a fairly good split between GP, LP, and a couple of advisors covering most regions. So we have UK, Europe, um, Americas, and Australia. And you know, I'm there representing emerging markets. So that, that's just a little bit of background. And perhaps a question for each of the participants to start with. In your view, are the IPEV guidelines currently fit for purpose, in particular, given what we have seen as a result of COVID? And if I start with Erica. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Yes, I do think they're fit for purpose. I think we need flexibility in our business to uh, have different ways to assess the measurement of the value 
and particularly in times like this with, with greater volatility. So I think the special guidelines that came out that helped to kind of remind us of, of kind of key features to consider, uh, particularly if you wanted to move from LTM to NTM, uh, as, you, as you think about the past may not be so indicative of the future. So I do think, uh, I think we found it fit for purpose and we were able to, we didn't feel we were constrained as we were tackling our valuations in Q1 and Q2 of this year. Thank you, Jazzy. Yeah, I would echo what Erica just mentioned as well. Um, and, you know, as we were valuing the portfolio at 3i, we didn't feel we needed more guidelines because, you know, the guidelines have enough flexibility and we were also able to complement with our own internal guidelines that we have um, in terms of the valuation policy that we follow when we're valuing our portfolio. So I don't think that was a constraint. I mean, the harder bit was the volatility and the uncertainty and looking at various sectors and various countries on how um, each one of those overlay and applied. Um, but there was enough flexibility within the guidelines to use different triangulation methods as well. Great, thank you. Um, you I think Erica mentioned that the um, the special valuation guidelines, guidance. Um, yeah, I think it would be useful to get your view as to whether that um, special guidance be before going to Erica and Jazzy. I'll ask Daniel in your I guess your role as a, an iPad board member. Perhaps you could give a little bit of the background as to why it was felt necessary to issue um, the special guidance. Especially, I think, um, because of um, the several requests uh, received from our members or from um, fund managers, uh, where they felt, um, yeah, they had difficulties actually in evaluating their portfolio companies. From a board perspective, I think that we uh, thought that um, the guidelines already contained actually most of uh, or have the most important topics included. And therefore, there is the flexibility we have just heard that um, people are able to use the guidelines for the evaluation. Nevertheless, uh, we uh, should be somehow, um, yeah, give some more guidance actually uh, that actually the double dip actuation uh, um, was the uh, crucial point. Uh, meaning that um, when we look at earnings, that um, when the uh, fund managers uh, did actually um, uh, adjusted their earning um, forecast, uh, then um, they should also actually um, adjust the used multiples uh, in the appropriate corresponding way um, that um, we don't have a double dip. Um, what that means in earnings, actually, when we uh, say, okay, what does it mean for the portfolio companies, the revenues, customer supply chain, and the operations? Um, also, the shortfalls, what they have seen perhaps in Q1, um, how obviously they should take into account the future um, shortfall as far as possible. Um, the guideline needs to be uh, in line with um, the accounting standards so actually one needs to use all information at the evaluation point in time um, nothing which is more used is allowed to be um, taken into account so um, that's I think where the board said okay and which we did actually um, in I think early April um, that or end of um, March, I think. Uh, fall I think it was then March. And uh, end of March, end of they March, came out. Yeah, end of just March, the end they of were March. able actually to um, to do the validations uh, for Q1. So um, we said, okay, we need to bring it out um, end of March. Yeah. Great, thanks, Daniel. Uh, maybe Erica, um, I mean, did you find that special guidance um, helpful, or? You know, <laughs> Was it just reiterating what was already there? I think it was partially reiterating what was already there and then also confirming a lot of what we were discussing internally about what we should potentially consider 
and and focus on with extra focus in in our Q1 valuations, particularly the risk environment, and you know, kind of taking a refresh on, you know, if you're in our in our business, we are working with a little bit older information, so taking extra efforts to get updates and think about the impacts, especially in March, and for businesses like ours, where we have to, with a public parent, you're really finalizing valuations effectively at the end of March, not in late April or a later period for that time. So you don't have as much visibility into the future so or into what, how that impact and then be able to put that into a Q1 mark. So I think it just, it, it just, just I guess, uh, confirmed uh, how we were thinking about taking a, you know, maybe a special emphasis, not really changing our approach, but taking extra special care you know, think about industry location and really uh, digging deeper um, to, to make sure we were thinking a bit more forward and about the, about the potential impacts uh, to each of the companies. Okay, that's great. Um, but, yeah, I guess one of, the, you know, one of the things we were very keen to put across as, um, as a board was that the the revised or the special guidance wasn't a change of um, emphasis. It wasn't a change to the guidance. It was really trying to make sure people were aware of the different tools that would be available to assist in the valuation process in you know, a time, you know, especially thinking about the fact we were doing this late March. So a time of great uncertainty, you know, I think we were seeing daily um, movements in um, listed share prices of you know, 10, 20 percent um, swings each day. And it was very difficult to sort of try and, you know, with my CFO hat rather than IPEV board hat on, it was almost impossible to try and know where the markets were going, never mind what was happening in our portfolio company. And, and I think we felt the need to just to try and pick out a few things that people needed to, to be aware of um, and to consider when performing the, the certainly the quarter, March quarter valuations. But fundamentally, it still boils down to, you know, we should be using fair value where you know a willing buyer a willing seller at a specific point of time well I, I guess a question now is is that in the sort of volatile environment that we've just seen is that still the most appropriate valuation metric the sort of fair value as it's defined maybe uh jazzy if you could give your view on that yeah, sure. Happy, happy for that. Um, so from our perspective, you know, we, we went into March reporting and, you know, being a listed business, we were to announce our results within six weeks. So it was really hard trying to get a balance between getting the right information, but also trying to apply judgment on, you know, what are we looking at? You know, are we looking at a four month lockdown or what is our base case assumption? And being able to apply that consistently, but also looking at individual aspects of the business. So we looked at various aspects in terms of liquidity, resilience of the business. But one of the things that we emphasize more on the long term perspective of this particular business, has that changed as part of this uncertainty? And that played a huge factor in the way we valued the business. And we did look at, you know, a willing buyer, a willing seller. But being a GP, you know, we're under no pressure with a strong balance sheet to sell our assets. Um, and, and do we absolutely believe in the value of this business and the growth trajectory as part of making that investment? Then we had we also applied an element of long-term judgment, um, and that played a big part in the adjusted multiples. So as we saw the multiples, um, you know, the variability and the volatility with it, a lot of the portfolio had adjusted multiples. We used a lot of um, triangulation methods in certain aspects to look at, you know, DCFs, uh, but not primarily moving towards them because. You, you know, the earnings basis was what we were looking at. Uh, and, and, you know, it was trying to get a blend, blend in different sectors where we had visibility on the earnings, but also a good forecast and what else was going on within the business and how they were going to recover um, and also liquidity pressures. So I think it was a multiple of various things that we were looking at um, in, in trying to pull that value together. 
Great, thank you. Now, I know from from my perspective, um, you know, probably about to show my age and how long I've been in the industry. Um, but you know, when I started, um, the the sub more common valuation metric was the lower of cost and net realizable value. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I remember being one of the ones that was pushing hard against the uh, introduction of fair value. Be and I think our argument at the time was no one really cares that much. Um, what matters is what you get for it at the end of the day. Cash is king. And I know, you know, in the run up to the special guidance, we were getting a lot of questions from um, other managers about whether they could just ignore the March quarter end, roll forward December values until we had a great deal of certainty. Um, so perhaps Daniel, from an LP perspective, how important was it that fair value as at the end of March was used? It was very important. I mean, we uh, received several questions and forwarding. I mean, on the one hand, uh, as you mentioned before, I mean, that wouldn't be in line with accounting standards. And if uh, we would actually take forward uh, valuations, then we would get problems with our auditor. Um, and therefore, uh, to get new valuation with the latest forecast, uh, which shows actually also a dip. I mean, uh, when our investors looked actually in the valuation, they expected that uh, we have a movement which is somehow in line with the public markets. So uh, just to forward it and say, okay, we stay constant, then actually they wouldn't believe in the long run in private equity valuations. Great, thank you. Now, for the next couple of questions, I'm going to sort of switch the uh, the usual format onto its head um, and I guess give the other um, sort of panelists not just an opportunity to ask maybe myself and Daniel as IPEV board members a question, but also give you the opportunity to tell us what, um, what you would like to see, what changes, if any, you would like to see in the next iteration of the guidelines. Um, and you know, this is also something that I think when we're open to audience questions, it would be interesting to see what any of the other participants' views are on this. But maybe Erica, we start with what, what would you like to see changed in the next iteration of guidelines, if anything? Sure, I mean, I actually, I, I'm not, uh, a proponent for this change I'm going to ask about, but I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on if it's something IPEV is, is considering or if you've received questions around this. But, you know, private market valuations have historically not been as volatile as public markets. We saw that during the global fi financial crisis, and I think we've already seen this now in Q1 as well as, you know, Q2, our drop in Q1. Uh, marks were not as strong as what we saw in the public markets and thus, of course, Q2 recoveries were, were more muted. But I don't think there should be a stronger correlation and I, and I do think less volatility in private markets is defendable depending on the portfolio and the underlying assets, of course. But do you think, given what we're now kind of living through, do you think markets, investors, or regulators will expect there to be a further change or further alignment? So. You know, to the to the question, we rely a lot on you know willing participants and what they would you know transact at to really help defend the fact that we may not see as volatile movements as you see in the public markets. But just curious to see if you think we'd get pressure uh, to shift that. Um, yeah, I, I think my view on that is probably not mm -hmm. um, because you know. Certainly, when we tend to transact, so at selling a particular asset, the price that you get on the sale does not change day on day with um, you know, with the public market. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's a much more it's you know, typically an intermediated transaction. It's a negotiated price. 
um, which has less volatility than if you were trading on the public market. So I think it's probably correct that we see less volatility of, um, of private assets. Um, because, you know, especially if you're looking at the trade sale, it's driven by a number of factors, not just the, um, the price of similar listed businesses. Um, so, you know, I think I would be surprised if we saw much more of a push in that direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from a personal perspective, I would think that would be wrong mm -hmm. Agreed. to go that way. Um, Jazzy, I don't know if you have any any views on the future direction. No, no, no particular views, but it, it, it's probably one where we all need to be vigilant um, and see how this pans out. Because I think for me, you know, the guidelines are there, there's enough flexibility. But as you say, it's trying to marry the guidelines and the accounting principles, uh, because, you know, valuation is, is now really hard for it to be matched. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely right. And yeah, I guess going back to that point, would we see the volatility? I know from our own portfolio, we had one a partial sale that was negotiated of um, probably August last year, completed on you know, probably the second week of April with no change in price, whereas mm -hmm. everything around you had been going through sort of massive drops and followed by a sort of slightly smaller increase and drops again so yeah I, I think the evidence is there that transactions do not take place um with the same degree of volatility dan i don't know if you have you know from an insider's perspective is there anything we've missed I mean, what could be interesting, I see that actually the industry has improved. So when we look at the correlation between public market, uh, between the public market and private equity, it used to be actually the biggest correlation, um, two quarters. Um, yeah, between them and now it's actually one quarter. Uh, now, um, knowing that actually we have a time lag of um, a quarter uh, when um, JPGP is providing the valuation. So uh, we are, um, as an industry, quicker than in the past. And that was also important, actually, for our investors to see, OK, um, private equity is quick and not like in the last crisis, um, in the great financial crisis, when actually our investors thought, OK, uh, they already got the biggest hits, and then actually private equity came around uh, two quarters uh, later, and then they had the big impairments, uh, which nobody had expect expected. Yeah, I, I would echo that as well, Paul. I think, you know, from, from compared to the last recession, you know, information has been available much more quicker. The firms have been very proactive and so has the businesses in trying to manage um, to try and get information, but also try and apply um, that information in, in valuation, but also in other factors in terms of liquidity and resilience um, and ongoing operations. Okay, um, well, that's great. Um, I think that probably about all we have time for. So thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.